Good morning and welcome to chapel, our first chapel here in the Paul W. Powell Chapel this term. So grateful that you're here. As we begin, please allow me to introduce a few groups of folks that are with us. First of all, for those uh, doctorate of ministry cohorts that are on campus this week, I believe that this is seminar one and seminar three. Would you please stand doctor of ministry students so that we can welcome you this morning? Grateful for you as we are for our Doctorate of Ministry program, uh, led by Previn Vong, assisted by Brian DeVries and Emily Ball. Also, if you are a new student this semester, it may be that you're a new Doctorate of Ministry student, would you please stand so that we can welcome new students? Over on my left, your right, you will see a number that have stood. I also want to welcome any number of Baylor undergrads who are receiving their chapel credit through worship with us this semester on Tuesdays at 11. Can I invite you all to stand again so we can say good morning to you? We're delighted that you're here. In the event that uh, you attended Baylor, you may remember that uh, chapel was chapel form in the Waco Hall. As a result of Aaron Monis and the work of others, Baylor Chapel now has 66 different iterations. I am delighted that I don't have to keep up with those, but one of those opportunities, options, uh, is in fact worship with us. We're really glad uh, that you're here. This uh, uh, September, the first three chapels will be given over to a special emphasis, and I've asked Dr. Poe Hayes, who is responsible in large part for getting this emphasis going, to come up and to introduce us to what we can anticipate today, next Tuesday, and the following Tuesday. Dr. Poe Hayes. Good morning. It's so good to see you all back here. Uh, we are going to spend the next three chapels, um, well, the next three weeks, so not just chapel services, um, celebrating and learning from the legacy of a woman called Her Helen Barrett Montgomery. Anybody ever heard of her? Right? A few? Yeah, a few. She was really, really famous in her day. We're going to try to sort of revive some fame because she's really... Um, an inspiring figure in a number of realms. So she was, um, 2024 is gonna mark, marks the 100th anniversary of her publication of um, a New Testament translation. And it was the first translation to be um, published by a woman from the Greek. And she tried to drop her Greek class. She tried to get out of it real hard, is what I understand. Uh, but she ended up translating the New Testament. Um, we're gonna, so there, that's significant. Um, but out of that love for scripture, Greek or otherwise, uh, she was really committed to a number of um, things that, that really capture a lot of who Truett tries to, to be. And so she was um, a champion for women and for uh, social reform and for women in ministry. She was the first female president of an American denomination. Um, so I think in 1921, she was the pre elected president of the Northern Baptist Convention, which is now the American Baptist Convention. Um, she was committed to missions and to social reform and to education and making that accessible uh, worldwide and um, to a range of people that tended to be overlooked. Um, so over the next few weeks, uh, we're going to have, uh, well, this morning we're get kicking it off with Dr. Joel Gregory, um, who is the one that I can credit with bringing um, Helen Barrett Montgomery to my attention. Um, he's going to talk about her role in denominational life. And what do you do? She was president of a denomination at a time um, that was very fraught. It was polarized. People were angry. Nobody could have, you know, 
civil discourse wasn't really a thing. And so it sounds a little familiar. So maybe, uh, maybe we can learn something there. Next week, uh, we will celebrate our Wilson Addis lecture. Alicia Myers, who is a professor of New Testament at Campbell, uh, in North Carolina is going to bring our Wilson Addis lecture. She is co-authoring a book on Helen Barrett Montgomery with Mandy McMichael, who is a professor in our religion department. And so they're going to lead a workshop for us. They're going to lead, uh, their, she, uh, Dr. Myers is going to bring chapel. Um, we're going to have a whole opportunity to talk about education and missions. Um, the next week, we're going to have uh, two Truett alums, Aaron and Grace Ogburn. Um, if you've had me for Hebrew, you have met Grace. She's a Bible translator. Her husband, Aaron, uh, works with refugees and asylum seekers across Europe. They live in Milan, but they happen to be on home assignment right now, and so they're going to come and talk to us about, we're going to have a workshop about um, ministry to vulnerable population groups like asylum seekers and refugees. We're also going to have a workshop about um, Bible translation and how that works. Um, all that to say, um, stay tuned. I hope that you will um, try to be not just in the chapels, but come to the lunches. There is food. Um, and to, to see what we can learn from this really significant historical figure um, for our ministry context today. So, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Pohays. Um, how do you introduce someone who needs no introduction? You take Jesus's advice to Judas and you do so that which you do quickly. <laughs> Dr. Joel Gregory, until May of this year, was the George W. Truett uh, Chair of Preaching and Evangelism. He was also the director of the Kyle Lake Center for Effective Preaching and Professor of Preaching. Before he came to Truett Seminary some 19 years ago, Dr. Gregory was the senior pastor of the First Baptist Church of Dallas. Prior to that, he was the lead pastor at Travis Avenue Baptist Church. Prior to that, Gambrel Street Baptist Church. Dr. Gregory holds the Bachelor of Arts from Baylor University, the Masters of Divinity from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and the PhD from Baylor University which leads us to understand something about Dr. Gregory that not many of us might know. Everyone rightly knows Dr. Gregory as a student of, preach of preaching and a practitioner of the same. He's also a New Testament student, having taken a PhD in New Testament, and over the years has also become quite interested in Baptist movements. So Dr. Gregory is well-placed to speak to the topic that Dr. Poe Hayes has introduced, and we're so grateful for our chapel uh, musicians who will now lead us. Ryan and others, please. Hi, y'all. It's so good to see y'all again, good to see y'all's faces. Um, if you would, please rise, let us, if you're able, worship however you desire. We will be on hymnal number 332. Let us praise.
Good morning. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is found in Ephesians 4, verse 7 to 13. It says, but, with, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Amen.
Dean Still, thank you for your gracious words of uh, introduction, and to Dr. Rebecca Poe Hayes for setting the stage for these weeks of the memory of Helen Barrett Montgomery. Dean Still, it's good to be back after the world's shortest retirement. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity to be here again with friends, colleagues, and the student body. <clears throat> Helen, help us. Now, to those of a certain age, that might ring a bell. Helen Bollett wrote a syndicated advice column in 200 daily newspapers. Almost every word of that is now antiquated. There used to be papers every day, and at the breakfast table, people would read Ann Landers, our dear Abby. Ellen Bottle wasn't in that league, but she gave advice to parents about parenting and uh, invented some interesting national movements uh, half a century ago. One was stamp out studying. For those who didn't want to, quote, go steady, in high school, she started an organization. Some of you look very puzzled at that phrase yourself. Uh, that meant that if you were a fragile young woman in high school in love with a letter jacket wearing offensive lineman, you could wear that in the halls of your high school. Now, if you didn't have a letter or if you didn't have a jacket, you were subject to what we'd now call cancel culture. <laughs> she tried to help people like that. Helen, help us. <laughs> but there's another Helen that on a higher, holier, heavier level could be of help to us. And that's who we're focusing on during this month. Helen Barrett Montgomery, <laughs> a woman who translated the New Testament, and it was published when she was 63 years old, as Dr. Poe Hayes said, the first woman to translate and publish a New Testament from Greek in history. She worked on it for nine years before she issued that New Testament, and it's still available today. It's become my favorite daily reading translation since I discovered it several years ago. But Helen Barron was a woman of first in more ways than that. She was the first woman to be on the Rochester, New York School Board. She was the first woman elected as president of the New York Federation of Women's Clubs after she gave an extemporaneous speech and they were so moved they elected her president the next day. It's already been alluded to the fact that she was the first woman to be the president of a national denomination in the United States, what was then the Northern Baptist Convention. She was a person of firsts. Now, my assignment today is kind of in that awkward borderland between a chapel sermon and an address. Uh, the address is about Helen, <laughs> who was she, and the sermon is, how could we be more like her? <laughs> Helen Barry Montgomery was born in 1861 in Ohio. Her father, quickly moved to Rochester, New York, where he showed up at University of Rochester with $27 in his pocket and graduated a classical scholar. Remember, in 1861, Abraham Lincoln was the president. As a two-year-old, Helen Barrett Montgomery wouldn't remember the Battle of Gettysburg that happened 304 miles to the south. That was the beginning of her life. She lived through 16 presidents by the time she passed away in 1934. <laughs> she was in a different world. Any span of time in American history shows a difference, but this metamorphosis in American culture was remarkable. Here she died. The Germans first called Adolf Hitler das Führer, and Donald Duck quacked for the first time. <laughs> Helen Barrett Montgomery's life spanned a significant part of our national history. She was a devout, spirited young woman growing up in a pastor's home in Rochester. It's amused to read in her biography some time ago that her strict Baptist parents did not believe women should wear braided hair to school. 
So she and her sister would take off unbraided, braid their hair on the way to school, and unbraid it before they got back home. <laughs> she uh, was a persuasive young woman. She tried to get a friend to make a commitment that for their entire life they would slide down banisters rather than take steps. Her friend wisely said no. And she was early on creative. Rather than read Pilgrim's Progress, she and her sister Anne would act it out in their family home. The basement was the city of destruction. <laughs> The third floor was the celestial city. The delectable mountains was out a window into a parapet under the room, and Apollyon lived in a closet. This was a signal of a creativity that would show up in so many ways later in her life. Her education was partly at home through her classicist father, as well as at preparatory school, where kids might pile up in bed with parents today if they're reading uh, about uh, hobbits or Harry Potter, when they piled up and dead with their father, they conjugated Latin verbs. Amo, amawi, amatus, as daddy audited this. She went to Wellesley College, now considered one of the greatest women's colleges in America. It was then and now an all-women's school. Almost forgotten today as it was founded by evangelicals 10 miles outside of Boston when she was a student. There was a 20-minute devotional period after breakfast and chapel and communion. It's a distinguished school. Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State, was graduated from there. Uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton was graduated there, as well as Diane Sawyer and a whole list of prominent influencers. She was in one of the early classes when she graduated at 23 years of age. Dr. Poe Hayes referred to a humorous anecdote that She'd had so much Latin, she didn't want any Greek. <laughs> Her mother wrote the president, pleading that she would not have to take Greek, but he declared Helen would take Greek. Isn't it interesting that this undergraduate made to take Greek eventually translated the New Testament for nine years from Greek? Dr. Weaver, that ought to encourage students if you want to tell them. She went to Brown University, earned a master's degree there at that uh, used to be Baptist Ivy League University, then taught high school for a year, was so gifted that she became the co-principal of the Wellesley Preparatory Academy in Philadelphia, and it looked like she was headed toward uh, one of those Jane Austen kind of lines where she would give her singleness to ministry and work and good things. When she met uh, William Ben Montgomery, who, who, who uh, had no formal education, who was a salesman. Uh, her parents advised against the marriage. He was seven years older and was a widower. But they knelt together, and he led them in prayer that their life together might be devoted to the Lord. And they centered that life in the Lake Avenue Baptist Church in Rochester, New York. William taught a men's class for 40 years, and she taught a women's class with 250 members for 44 years. And that became a basis of a skyrocketing influence on the part of Helen Barrett Montgomery. Remember, in her own lifetime, she was known by millions of Christians, not just in the U.S., but all over the world. Today, forlornly, she's almost forgotten. And that's one reason that uh, uh, Rebecca and I are willing and wish to resuscitate her memory and revitalize her influence because of what she did and who she was. Uh, in that career, as I've said before, she became first president of an American Baptist denomination, president before that of the American Baptist Missionary Society, achieved things that were incredible in that age. She started a young women's movement in support of global missions that would eventually involve 700,000 young women in 3,500 chapters. The year before she became president of the Northern Baptist Convention, those young women raised $7,900,000 to build 10 mission centers globally. The achievements of her life uh, 
almost defy description concerning when she did it. But I've called this heaven, Helen, help us because of a specific passage in her life. Others are going to talk about her Bible translations. They're going to deal with her domestic feminism, as it was called, but I'm to focus on her as a denominational leader in the largest crisis that Baptists had faced in the United States up to that time. Northern Baptist Convention had been formed in 1907. Before that time, it was a gaggle of competing societies around education, missions, and charity, but they came together in Oklahoma City to form a denomination. Uh, the gravitas of that is seen in its first president, Charles Evans Hughes, who was a Baptist governor of New York, later the 11th Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. It was an age when people like Rockefellers and Kraft of the Cheese Company were Baptist leaders. And yet at that time, the battle between the denomination and an insurgent fundamentalist group threatened to tear apart the work and the witness of the Northern Baptist Convention. That battle framed the presidency of Helen Barrett Montgomery, 1921 and 1922. You know, before we come to talk about that, uh, you'll find in your worship folder four passages from Helen's uh, New Testament translation. And I want to look at these a moment because they inform us of the principles that animated her leadership while she was the president of the Northern Baptist Convention. Would you allow me just to make a running comment or two about these? The first in the Montgomery New Testament, which incidentally has delightful chapter titles and subtitles in paragraphs. The subtitle here is The Rise of party spirit. Now I beg you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to speak in accord, all of you, and to have no divisions among you, but to be knit together in a common mind and temper. When I read her translation, I was taken aback that uh, Helen used the gender specific translation of Adelphoi, brothers. She was certainly aware that that was a broader word. Yeah, decades later, the NIV would translate it brothers and sisters. Gordon Fee translates it brothers and sisters. I had to scratch my head. Why would Helen say brothers? I think I know why. She was already in the middle of a battle. She had just translated the New Testament in a King James only environment. And I think she might have decided I can't fight every battle right now. So she addresses them as brothers. She would demonstrate that you can't fight every battle. But then he says, I, she says, I beg you. That word paracolo, our beloved colleague David Garland said, was used in a sense of love and of trust. Not a mandate, but I'm pleading with you. This was the quality of Helen Barrett Montgomery's leadership. She never led from above, berating people, but in love and trust, speaking both to the left and the right of her denomination, she was pleading with them as a sister in Christ. And what did she plead? Well, look at this, her translation. No schisms among you, but be knit together, speaking in one accord. Helen Barrett Montgomery was an iconic Baptist leader because she understood Baptists as a free church, autonomous people are never going to be in uniformity. But she did call for us to be in unity. You want uniformity in life? I'll tell you where you can find it. In most cemeteries. <laughs> if you'll sight down the tombstones in the cemetery, if it's in doubt, they're all lined up perfectly but it's also very dead. Or you can find them in old-fashioned ice cube trays. If you don't know what they are, it's the way you used to make ice cubes, and they were lined up in lines, but they were cold and they were dead. Helen Barrett Montgomery understood in a diverse group of Baptists that they were to speak in one accord. 
I like Dr. Garland's uh, reference to this. He says it's like singing in harmony from one page of music rather than a cacophonous group of cats howling at midnight. It's a vivid way of saying one accord. But notice this, knit together. <laughs> J.B. Phillips translated that, uh, all working together to achieve unity. I like Helen's translation better. This woman who coined almost the word domestic feminism, who at Wellesley, along with the other women there, were housekeepers as well as students, understood what it meant to knit together. You know if you've studied Greek at all that that word's used for setting broken bones or for mending nets. You don't catch many fish with a hole in a net. And she knew that's where the Northern Baptist Convention was headed. But then flip over a few pages to another. This is actually from the second chapter of Philippians. Verse 3, do nothing out of strife, nothing out of vanity, but let each one in true humility consider the others to be of more account than himself. That word strife was the word Paul used in the previous chapter to describe those who were preaching just to irritate him when he was in prison in Rome. There were some kind of professing Christians who wanted to make his manacles bite into his wrist and his fetters hurt his ankle bones and they were preaching out of strife. <laughs> Ellen Barrett Montgomery faced a strife-torn denomination. And I wonder how she reflected on this. In fact, she goes on uh, to say in this, out, not out of vanity, but each one in true humility considering others to be of more account than himself. Not out of vanity. Gordon Fee says that this over self-regard, that I am more than I am, is the very nature of fallenness. In the posthumous biography of Helen Barrett Montgomery, friend after friend made statements about her like this. She was great because she was more than she seemed to be. She was called to be exceptional, but never ceased to be ordinary. It was the witness of people who watched her life, and she was an affluent woman because of her husband's business. They said whether it was a head of state or a national figure or her own housemaid, cook or chauffeur, she treated everyone the same. As she was wrestling with persons like uh, Shaler Matthews, the left-leaning dean of the University of Chicago, or William Bell Riley, the fiery fundamentalist of the First Baptist Church in Minneapolis, she dealt with both of them with firmness but with gentleness, counting all of them as brothers. Or 2 Timothy 2.10, always. <laughs> uh, let's just take a look at that. 2 Timothy 2.10, if I might. Always call these truths to men's mind, adjuring them in the presence of God to avoid controversy. It is a useless thing and subverts those who listen to it. As she presided over a divided denomination, she understood the subversion of fruitless chattering. This is sometime translated. It leads to a Greek loan word, literally catastrophe. That's the word that Paul used in 2 Timothy. Incidentally, in the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, that's the word used of what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a strong word. And she recognized she was presiding over a denomination that unless it found common ground, was leading to a catastrophe. Finally, look again at her translation in second chapter. Her, her chapter titles um, are always informative to me. The Lord's slave must not quarrel, but must be kind to all men, a skillful teacher, patient of wrong. That is, if you're engaged in leadership, you can't afford to become resentful. Can you imagine in 1921, 
a woman who had translated the New Testament and was for the first time president of a national denomination. What was hurled at her in print and from platforms, never in any of her 10 books or her platform speaking did Helen ever reveal an instance of resentment as what was hurled at her. I wanted to read these verses from her own translation, and it was a preparation to ask, well, how did she help us? In 1920, in the National Baptist Convention in Buffalo, New York, there was a pre-convention meeting of 6,000 fundamentalists. It was unprecedented in American history. One hypnotizing preacher after another called on the investigation of the seminaries of the Northern Baptist Convention. It was for many a toxic atmosphere that set the agenda for when she became the president of the convention. That battle involved battling newspapers, the Baptist, which was left-leaning toward the denominational establishment, the Watchman Examiner, edited by Curtis Laws, who invented the word fundamentalist on the right. They battled it out in people's homes all over the Midwest and the Northeast. He was battling personalities. On the one hand was the dean of the University of Chicago Divinity School, Shaler Matthews, who was almost exactly the same age as Helen Barrett Montgomery. Uh, Shaler Matthews' theology was not typical of the Baptist of that day. Just to read a statement or two, in Cawthon's Taxonomy of Liberalism, the University of Chicago of Shaler Matthews belongs to Cawthon's category, Modernistic Liberalism. Among the things that he put in print in his 28 books, Jesus was not the unique savior to these thinkers. He was not the source of Christianity, but an example of the truths that could be found without him, presenting Christianity in terms acceptable to 20th century science. Uh, Matthews conceived Christianity. It's not a body of dogmatic propositions, but rather a social movement, a lifestyle. Uh, theology's task is to find contemporary conceptualizations for outdated norms such as atonement. These he articulated in 28 books as president of the Northern Baptist Convention and the Federal Council of Churches of Christ. By the end of his career, um, he seemed to have thought uh, that there was not an ontological God. Well, if you step back from that and imagine a corn farmer in Iowa, <laughs> or a Baptist businessman in New York trying to weigh the theology of Shaler Matthews, you might just imagine that it could be disruptive. But at the other extreme was William Bell Riley, the president of the First Baptist Church, the pastor of First Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota for 50 years. He was graduate of Hanover College, a Presbyterian school, and of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He built a fortress, three different schools, 60 books, a monument to fundamentalism. He never quit the Northern Baptist Convention, but every year until his last year stood on the floor fighting the fundamentalist cause. He was an inerrantist, a premillennialist, an anti-evolutionist, and an indefatigable worker. Now imagine, if you would, Helen Barrett Montgomery with the dean of the University of Chicago on one side and with William Bell Riley on the other, becoming the president of a denomination whose meeting had been preceded with 6,000 fundamentalists wanting to investigate its schools. <laughs> and you might have some understanding of the kind of leadership she was called upon to give. One thing she did was address both signs as a sister in Christ, but straightforward. In preparation for a book I'm doing for Baylor University Press on Baptist Battles, uh, I read all of her existent letters that are in the archives of the American Baptist Convention that are now in Georgia. Writing Shaler Matthews, she said, I am very anxious to have you give at Columbia a thoroughly evangelical address 
such as I know you are capable of giving. There are a lot of people who have a false idea of you, and they need to get their eyes opened. In the same letter, she pleaded with him to rid the academy of the heterodox, and she could be very pointed. She said to Shigler Matthews, I have a good reactionary longing to get my hands on every one of the gentry that are making things hot for us in our various educational institutions. She wants to put them out the door and close the door on them. That's how she wrote Shigler Matthews. On the other hand, writing the fundamentalist leaders, writing one, comparing the National Baptists to the divisions at Corinth, she pleads, can we not, my brother, abandon this fighting spirit and use these party shibboleths no more? She wrote Curtis Laws, the conservative editor of the Watchman Examiner, deploring the fundamentalist attacks on NBC school and pleading for a fair hearing. The interesting thing about her leadership was publicly, uh, she was trying to maintain equilibrium while privately writing the left and the right, pleading with them not to rend the fabric of the denomination. That is, she led from the center. If we want Helen to help us, we might want to listen to her own definition of herself as a Baptist. She said, I'm one of the large number of middle-of-the-road Baptists. I believe fully in the great verities of our faith, the inspiration of Scripture, the deity of Christ, His atoning death, the reality of the resurrection, the kingdom of God, and the binding nature of the command of Jesus to make disciples of all nations. Listen to her centrist sanity. We have a great task awaiting us. An agonized world calls on us to do our share in building the kingdom. I do not believe we can afford to go aside for definitions, however necessary they may be. I have faith in God. Believe he will clarify the situation as we obey him. You remember once when the disciples asked Jesus to bid someone because he was not following them, he reproved them. And I believe that would be his attitude today. Can we not all conservatives and progressives love and trust one another and speak the truth in love? In a denomination that was rent left and right and facing the biggest battle Baptist had faced in the United States until that time, she was willing to stand and try to pull extremes toward the middle. In fact, so much so that even the leadership of the denomination uh, disagreed with her, she, the executive leadership. She decided that uh, the fundamentalists were carping about never being on the program. So in the face of no from the executive leadership of the denomination, she invited to give them a speaker and a session. Uh, W.C. Biting, the executive director, said, you're handling a rattlesnake. Well, fundamentalists being what they are, that was not enough. And they said, we want a whole day and we want to choose the speakers. And she couldn't do that. It was something solved in some ways in Indianapolis in 1922. William Bell Riley stood on the floor of the convention and <laughs> moved the New Hampshire Confession of Faith, reading the whole thing as part of his motion. That was 18 different categories. It'd be like reading the Baptist faith in message on the floor of a message. Cornelius Wolfgang, the predecessor of Harry Emerson Fosdick, gave a substitute motion, and that is the New Testament is sufficient for faith and practice. And it won two to one. And really the battle was over with that, even though it went on through the 1920s. Helen Barrett Montgomery, however, always had another hand to play. She became part of one of the most imaginative things in history of Baptist in the United States. The president of Women's College, Columbia College in Stevens, Missouri, conceived the idea of leaders left and right from the Northern Baptist Convention and Southern Baptist leaders coming together at that college. He even paid for the event. It's incredible to think about the fact that Shigler Matthews and our eponymous namesake, George W. Truett, preached on the same program. Out of that, 
There arose a movement for a joint confession from Northern and Southern Baptists promoted by Helen Barrett Montgomery and E.Y. Mullins, president of the Southern Baptist Convention and at the same time Southern Seminary. Nine persons were appointed from each denomination to prepare a joint confession. Significance of that is both conventions were still filled with living veterans of the Civil War. It could have helped heal wounds that were deep. But when E.Y. Mullins took it to the executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention, they <laughs> rejected it completely. And he had to go back with embarrassment to tell his Northern Baptist counterparts that uh, Southern Baptists won't cooperate. Helen Barrett Montgomery, in that regard, refused to give up on the vision of something that would bring not just Northern Baptists, but all Baptist people together more closely. And that leads me to ask a question, how would Helen help us today? We're going to continue this discussion uh, at uh, lunch, but let me suggest this. Leadership from the middle often seems insipid, banal, if you like French, jejun, decaffeinated. <laughs> It's like watching, uh, binge watching all of Seinfeld. It's about nothing. <laughs> There's nothing sexy about leading from the middle. I mean, in our world, if, if you want to make headlines, uh, uh, join Antifa and, and be doxing those on the far right or be a misogynistic, racist, proud boy and march in the streets. That's where the news is. It's insipid in many ways to lead from the middle. I've been about the business of studying Baptist battles for several years now for a book, The Resignation of Charles Spurgeon from the British Baptist Union, over much of the same issues, uh, the leadership of Helen Barrett Montgomery, and something that some of us lived, the inerrancy controversy in the Southern Baptist Convention. I've come to this conclusion, in Baptist life, very little good ever grows out of these kind of controversies. In the British Baptist Union, there were 250,000 Baptists when Spurgeon was preaching at the largest Protestant church. Now there's something less than 200,000. <laughs> National Baptist Convention became the American Baptist Convention and American Baptist Churches USA <laughs> in 1980. They had 1.6 million members, now 1.2 million. In 1932, the General Association of Regular Baptists left, in 1947, Conservative Baptists. Or if you look at the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest Protestant body in the United States. It was in 1973, before Southern Baptists started fighting about inerrancy, that they baptized the largest number of people in the history of the denomination, 445,000 people. Last year, half that many were baptized. Simply as a study of history, there's no evidence that Baptist fights lead to better Baptist mission. Helen, help us. You know, Hebrews said we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, some people think that means they're calling out to us in witness. Run the race well. Others think they're actually witnessing us. Witnessing us. I've offered hope my grandmother Gregory was not witnessing my life, but uh, I don't know. Helen is there in that great cloud of witnesses. I've asked myself, Dean, what would she say to us here at George W. Truett Theological Seminary? Where is one place on this planet where indeed we're trying to have a generous orthodoxy? leading from the middle. I would hope that 
Helen would help us and would look down with a smile of encouragement and a word, that's where I wanted to be. We don't have saints in Baptist life in the sense of our Catholic friends, but if we did, Helen, uh, I hope you'd help us. Let's sing together and ask God's benediction before we continue this discussion in the hall nearby. Thank you so much. May we continue in worship. This is a song that we did a lot last year. It is one of Ryan Flanagan's own. Uh, we will be doing it by Lingo. So please stand. The lyrics are in the bulletin.
Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love and your mercies, which are new every morning. We thank you for the ministry, the legacy, the denominational presidency, and the life of Helen Barrett Montgomery. I ask, Lord, that you shape each and every one of us into the Christians, Lord, the denominational leaders, the pastors, the teachers, the preachers, Lord, that you have inspired us to be. I ask that you would help us to fulfill our calling, Lord, as we go throughout these days and these years at Truett and at Baylor. I ask that you would allow us to lead from the middle, as Helen did, that we would be inspired by her leadership and by the servant leadership of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask that you bless us as we go, that you give us your grace and your peace. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Hymn number 637. Thanks.